Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Asian Pacific American Awards for Literature brought to you by the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association. This is a virtual award ceremony and it is being recorded. My name is Stan Vasco and I will be hosting the ceremony along with my two co-chairs, Dora Ho and Helen Look. We will also be assisted by Eugenia Bay. So before we start, I would like to remind everyone about the Apollo Code of Conduct. Slide. Next slide. So we just wanna make sure that we do have uh, the code of conduct shown to you so that you know everybody would understand uh, about refraining from engaging in appropriate behavior. So uh, we have it listed here uh, and everybody can read it. Uh, I don't have to read the whole thing. Next. So I would like to welcome the winning authors who are joining us uh, today. Uh, we have uh, Debbie Lascar, who is the adult fiction winner of the Atlas of Reds and Blues, written by De Debbie Lascar, Lascar, published by Counterpoint. Next is our Youth Literature Honor title, uh, Franklin Love, a novel written by David Yoon, published by G.P. Putnam's Sons, part of Random House. And then our youth literature winner, they call us Enemy, uh, written by George Takai, Justin Eisinger, Stephen Scott, illustrated by Harmony Becker, published by Top Shelf Productions, part of IDW Publishing. And then our children literature honor title, I'm Okay, written by Patty Kim, published by Anthenium Books for Young Readers, an imprint of Simon & Schuster's Children's Publishing. Our picture book honor title, Bilal Cook's Doll, written by Aisha Saeed, illustrated by Anusha Saeed, uh, published by Salam, reads Simon & Schuster's Books for Young Readers, Our picture book winner, Queen of Physics, How Wu Chen Xiong Helped Unlock the Secrets of the Atom, written by Teresa Robinson, illustrated by Rebecca Huang, published by Sterling Children's Books. And now we are gonna be open for any questions. So for those of you, uh, you're on YouTube, we are live, you can direct your questions. Uh, but we, for now, we have some questions that will be uh, asked by my co-chairs to the, the winners who are here today. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Hi, everybody. I'm Eugenia Bay, and I'm going to be um, asking some questions that we've prepared for the authors. Just a reminder to everybody watching on YouTube, if you want to ask a question in the comments, you must log into YouTube beforehand. So please do so, and um, we'll be fielding your questions as they come in. Um, we'd like to start with <clears throat> Harmony, Harmony, Justin, and Stephen. Um, first of all, congratulations, um, and thank you for being with us today. Um, we wish we could all be um, here in person in Chicago, but we really, really appreciate your being with us online for this very uh, special award ceremony. Um, our, our question to you is, can you talk a little bit about how you became involved with they call this enemy, and also what it's like to be to work with George Takei. <laughs> yep. um, so I guess I'll start. I got involved in this project in December of 7, 2017. I was contacted by our editor Lee Walton at a um, like an indie comics convention in Brooklyn. Uh, but I wasn't. I didn't know what the project was about. He just told me that it was. Um, 
if I would be interested in a project about the Asian American experience or the Japanese American experience. Um, and I was like, well, I'm Japanese American and I experience things. So, okay, sounds good. Um, but it wasn't until a couple of months later that um, I got the call that it was for George Takei and that it was going to be about um, his experience in the Japanese incarceration camps. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was my first graphic novel project. So I was um, sort of out of my depth, but very much, very super excited to be involved. Working with George was an absolute pleasure. Um, he is incredibly passionate about getting this story into the hands of younger readers so that this history that happened to him and his family and so many countless others it will not be forgotten or repeated. Um, so he was very passionate about getting the details right. And it was um, absolutely incredible to be able to have his firsthand experience to be able to recreate everything that he experienced on the page. Justin. Uh, uh, first of all, thanks, Harmon. That's, that's uh, I always like to hear your, your experiences with the project and yeah, I mean, a lot of that to, to mirror a lot of that. Yes. So uh, I've been working with IDW Publishing as an editor for um, better part uh, over a decade and have had a passion to tell um, important nonfiction stories in the graphic novel medium for, for many years. Uh, it's such a fantastic tool to use to reach readers of all ages and backgrounds and share with them what can be and what this book demonstrates is a very complicated, um, troubling and horrific history and explain it to, to a really wide audience, right? These are things that, that need to be known and, and now more than ever. And, and that's a trajectory we never could have imagined we were going to be writing as we started sitting out on this book in 2016 and 2017. And so just real quickly, to segue into to getting a little bit from Stephen, um, the idea sort of landed that, that uh, I had learned about the Japanese American internment um, and incarceration during World War II in my public school upbringing in, in Central and Northeast Ohio. And obviously from George Takei's, you know, really high profile visibility and his willingness to always share these painful stories of his past in service of, of making sure this history is living and known, um, something two and two went together in my mind. And I thought, wow, George Takei has a story, much like Congressman John Lewis in his March books, that is just powerful and has to be known. And this is, would really fit into this medium. At that point, uh, I happened to uh, have a colleague, Stephen Scott, who had worked with George and his husband Brad on a pr project previously. And that's sort of where momentum for this idea really started to gain ground. And Stephen, can you speak to that briefly? Um, yeah, Justin and I had this very serendipitous conversation um, on the floor of New York Comic Con. We were talking about March and what was next, mm -hmm. something that we were both passionate about, you know, doing something in that vein. And so he had mentioned George Takei and the TED talk that he had done. And I was very familiar with this, having worked with George and knew how passionate he was about getting the word out on this story and his experiences. So one thing led to another. I reached out to them, asked Brad if he thought George would be interested. Turns out he was. And, and then the next thing we know, we're working with them on getting the story out and talking to him about his firsthand experiences. So yeah, it was just yeah wonderful to be a part of that. Yeah, and one more thing I would I would add for this for this audience specifically, uh, it was it was, you know, as I said, I, I sort of approached this project from an editor, and I was thinking, wow, what 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 great pieces can we bring together to tell this story? And in those early stages of development, and I think this is before Harmony even joined the team, we were looking at authors and illustrators and and who was sort of best to 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 to, to shepherd this story onto the page, and it was it was interesting. It was very sort of organic and interesting the way that. Um, uh, Stephen and I sort of became engaged as, as co-authors with George, and it was really sort of during that trust building process of, of working with George preliminarily and talking about how would this book work and how would my story, you know, because we could all read to the stars and, and, and see George's own description of these on the page and sort of talking through them and sort of this interesting trust process was born. And, and we're so grateful that, that we were able to, to do that and be a part of, of this really incredible story and, and that it's been able to be um, embraced by so many audiences and is now being used to teach this, like, as I said repeatedly, this really vital piece of history. Um, Harmony, yeah. anything else you'd like? Harmony, what else can you add to, the, to our, this little story? Uh, well, 
less about my or my experience on the book, but more just sort of wanting to um, speak specifically to this group of librarians um, and to say a thank you because uh, growing up, you know, I was always looking for myself in the books that I've read and I would not have known about the incarceration of Japanese Americans if it weren't for libraries. Uh, they didn't teach it in my school, um, but thanks to the libraries that I went to as a kid. This was something that was always in my mind ever since I was a child. So thank you all for your work in making history accessible to people. Thank you all, really appreciate your sharing your experiences and thank you Harvey for also um, sharing about it. Thank you also for um, uh, recognizing the role of libra uh, libraries in this. Um, so we, have a, we do have a question from the audience. Um, how were you guys able to collaborate on the graphic novel? Was there a lot of back and forth between everybody? <laughs> oh yeah, uh, um, yeah, absolutely. Great, great question. And it's as you may imagine, it was it was challenging. George is a very busy individual. He was constantly in Los Angeles or New York City or all over the world filming television shows. And we were Harmony was uh, living in I think Mexico City for most of the production of the book. And Stephen and I were in San Diego and or sometimes in Vancouver for Stephen. So all over the place. And yeah, we would use FaceTime uh, frequently to get all of us on a call. But even before we all got to the drawing of the book with Harmony, yes, there was uh, 20, 30 maybe hours of phone calls and FaceTimes to just walk through all the stuff to, to, to ask George to just, I mean, you know, it, and this, it's incredibly powerful to listen to George Decay tell you sort of one-on-one -on -one all these stories that we've heard before and seen again that every time it is it, it hits you right in all the all the places and so that was something that we got to experience it was both very uplifting and very emotionally draining too because the you know the, that pain is is palatable every single time yeah we wanted to make sure that we were getting the story right and having it live up to george's memories and and up to um yeah every the way that he told the story so there was a lot of back and forth once we had the script in hand and we were handing that off to him, making sure we had all the details right. And then and then Harmony can, Harmony can speak to this, especially where, where it came to the art, you know, art changes where just like getting things um, a little bit more correct in the way he remembered things, how things people looked or how people dressed or just like those kind of fine details. So it was really, um, yeah, just really, he was such a resourceful, person to have have that firsthand account, being able to get all of the history, all the details correct. It, even on um, the terror, he worked on this television show, they mm -hmm. used him as a consultant, right, mm -hmm. to get all of the, those details right. He could get it down to, you know, what the dishes look like, you know, he's like, no, they were more chipped than this, that kind of stuff. So it was, um, yeah, invaluable to have him at part of that whole process. Yeah, I remember specifically that I had been using reference pictures that I had found online, uh, specifically of Tully Lake, and they had told me that the the dining hall looked a certain way, and then I showed them to George, and he was like, no, it didn't actually look like that. So it was very valuable to have that firsthand um, experience to, because things can be labeled wrong online, like um, people put the tags in as like all different kinds of camps and then you get things that were at one camp and at another camp and it was very important to him. Uh, he remembered very specifically, I remember the layout of his uh, family's barrack in Tule Lake and he, he had done like a little sketch of it to show like how all the beds were like very close to each other and that it was divided into two rooms so that um, there is a drawing in the book that is sort of like a architectural layout sort of, of of that specific barrack and it's almost uh not traced but i mean it's it's copied almost exactly from his sketch that he did incredible <laughs> yeah it is really amazing to have somebody with a first-hand account of what it was like to be in the camp um, were you able to do any touring um uh like in schools or libraries before um before we all have to be uh, quarantined. And how was the re how was the response to the book <laughs> when, when you did? Uh, I was I I managed to attend this event in person, but I did do a, a library event in that was for the San Leandro Public Library and um, had a conversation with um, some of the librarians there, which was really 
um, it, it's super encouraging to see how much, I mean, the passion that librarians have for, for this story and for getting it into the hands of young readers. I feel very um, blessed and very fortunate that, that they sort of have taken on our book as, as something that they want to spread to, to get into the hands of as many people as possible. Yeah, absolutely. To think that we were able with to work together with George to document his history, to document uh, the invaluable nature of a firsthand witnesses account of, of these events in a medium like we did, and then to see the support from the education um, uh, world, you know, to see educators and teachers and librarians. Uh, I mean, we, we did not have a chance to do a lot of group touring or support for the book. And I can say that one, I think one of the highlights for me of this entire multiple year process was the was the four of us being on stage together in uh, DC last year for the ALA um, annual, mm -hmm. where we were all part of George's um, auditorium speech. And I, I have to tell you that the, the th things that I experienced and learned from from all of you great librarians that were even there in the audience that day asking questions of us then put ideas in my mind that I've taken back to my job, which has really become about this all mission of, of sharing history and important facts through graphic novel and has really empowered me to go back to my job and, and, and given me fuel to keep going. So thank you so much. I can't, can't, can't express it enough. Um, Scott, uh, was there anything that you wanted to add or? <laughs> oh, um, yeah, uh, I just, you know, wanted to echo everything Harmony and Justin were saying about that. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, just getting it into the hands of educators has been so amazing to see them reporting back to us that they're planning on introducing this subject to their their students through the use of our book, you know, so to be a part of that, to educate, you know, the next generation about this um, sorted part of American history, you know, I'm very, yeah, proud that we're able to um, yeah, to be a part of that, to, to, to get that message out to them, because like Harmony, I, you know, I went to a school in Ohio, and they didn't really teach this part of history to us, so um, like a lot of people, I became aware of it through George, and through him going out there, and giving these talks, and doing this important uh, work, as far as getting, yeah, um, using his platform to um, pass this message down to the next generation. And so with this graphic novel, the goal is to preserve that story for generations to come. So um, yeah, just to be a part of that has been, um, yeah, just a once in a lifetime experience. Thank you. And thank you all for being great allies and, and advocates as well. Um, we just have, we have one more question from the audience before um, we move on. And that is, are there any favorite stories that you learned or talked about that didn't make it into the book? <laughs> Yeah, I, I have a quick one. I have, I have a quick one, guys. And it's it's this, and by the way, my headphone. Um, we can't hear you. Okay, so I hope you guys can hear me now. Yes, no, yeah, we can. Okay, great, sorry about that. All of a sudden, a battery. No problem. Zoom calls. So um, in George's biography, autobiography, To the Stars, he tells a story sort of that he, there's, a, there's a character introduced late in the telling of his experience at Tule Lake who did not make it into our book. And, and that was an adopted dog they had named Blackie. And it was a, a mutt that, that, he, that the Kays adopted into their home and they had some nice experiences with it. And to be honest, in the To, to the Stars, there's a quite, a quite emotional goodbye that George says to the dog as he's forced to leave him in the camp and, and board the train to go to LA to meet, meet up with his father. Um, and we, we just, I mean, I'm a huge dog lover and uh, I know we all really are. So it, we were, there was no, no animosity towards the, the canine species in, in, in not having the dog in this story. But ultimately we decided that um, there were so many emotional threads already sort of woven into the story. It was, it would be challenging maybe to, to weave that one in right there at the end. And also, you know, George did say goodbye to the dog. And that, that was pretty, that was an additional layer of like, he left the dog behind. So we, <laughs> We didn't want to necessarily tie that. <laughs> so that was one thing that didn't make it in the book. Harmony or Steven, do you guys have any other better examples? I personally don't because once I got the script, it was pretty much totally completed. That's true. But I don't know, Steven, if you have anything. 
Uh, Justin took mine. I was going to say the story about Blackie too, because that, yeah, that was the thing that stuck out from the novel to me as well. It was right there into the stars, and and like and like Justin says, it's a very emotional beat there, and and you do very much feel for the dog. It was just, I guess, when it came down to the graphic novel and kind of trying to condense things into the narrative that we wanted to tell, Blackie just somehow fell through the cracks as far as you know, the introduction of this pet and then to have to say goodbye to it just, you know, didn't flow with what what the narrative that we had going. So um, when we had to break that news to George, like, sorry, your, you know, your pet dog didn't make it into the story. He was just like, oh, poor Blackie, but he understood. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. And and it's still in another, in, a, in um, his other book, so people can still learn about yeah, it. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you all so much. We really, really appreciate your being here and congratulations again for, for thank you guys. Thank you, yeah, guys. Thank you thank for you showing so him in black as well. It really means it really means a lot to us. Um and you know we it meant a lot to us to join you last year and it meant, means a lot again to join us again today. So thank you so much for the recognition and congratulations good luck with the, your continued mission. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, to echo Justin, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, very much appreciate this recognition. It's been yeah, such an honor. So much just to <laughs> echo uh, the other two. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And um, next up, we have uh, Debbie Lasker for the Atlas of Reds and Blues. And just give everybody a, a second to come on. Okay. Debbie, congratulations and thank you so much for being with us. Um, your book is especially timely right now during a time when the nation is really reckoning with racial injustice and state sanctioned violence. Um, we were wondering, how do you teach or talk about solidarity between South Asian American communities and Black communities in the face of police terror? Thank you so much for, um, for having me today and for this award. I am deeply honored. Um, you know, I had a minute to think about this, this <laughs> question. <laughs> and, um, you know, um, what I have been saying and, and is that, you know, we, we as good literary citizens, have to amplify each other's voices. And we have to not only promote the voices that are here already, but the ones that are emerging. Um, and we have to keep talking about hard subjects, you know, such as racism and police violence and misogyny and being invisible in America and being othered and treated as less than. And we will not experience change as a nation until we continue to have these conversations and keep keep the debate going, right? Because there is no change without conversation. And it is our job as, you know, as good literary citizens to uh, just keep talking about the hard stuff and keep promoting each other's work and build a community. Yeah. Um, how has the response to the book been, I guess, with the pandemic and also, um, Right with the with the current climate, political and social climate as well. <laughs> well, you know, um, when this book first came out, um, I was a fifty two year old um, debut novelist, and I had, <laughs> thank you, and I had actually no expectation beyond my family reading this book. Uh, I just didn't know what people were going to think, and I didn't know if anyone was going to be interested because. You know, it's, it's a hard topic. I don't know if people are interested in reading that. And I've just been floored by how, I've been floored by strangers, you know, mm -hmm. um, everywhere I have gone. And even if it is virtual nowadays, um, I see people who I don't know. And, and that, uh, that just really, um, that gives me a lot of hope that people are interested in this and, um, and that they are um, willing to take a risk and, and devote some of their precious time to something that's not exactly an easy read. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, how has it been for you to be able to, to write about this? And we, we know that it was based on a, a real life event that happened to you. Um, yeah, you know, I don't, um, so I guess the way I'll answer that is that um, I don't really believe in catharsis. Um, I, I don't write to feel better, and I, I haven't felt better as a result of writing this book, but I am deeply grateful that I'm writing. Um, 
you know, uh, the raid was 10 years ago, uh, the real life raid. And um, so it took me a few years to, to be able to start writing prose again. So um, I'm just grateful that I was able to write and, um, and I was able to communicate my uh, change as a person and my change as a writer. And so um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just very honored that, you know, it, it found a home and it has received the attention um, that it has. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're wondering, do you have any, any writing tips for first time authors? <laughs> that, um... Yeah, I do actually. Um, <laughs> so, you know, a good, um, I, I've had some really good teachers over the years, and um, one of them um, was my poetry teacher in graduate school, um, Lucille Clifton. And she was uh, she was a wonderful poet, but she was also a really good friend. And she's a she was a big believer in um, oral tradition, right? Uh, about reading your work out loud. And um, so my my tips for up and coming writers is to write every day, and and you know, to touch your work in some way every day, whether you're researching or writing for a few minutes or, or reading something, but to touch your work every day and, to, and then to give yourself um, the gift of reading your work aloud to yourself when you're done. And um, what Lucille used to tell us was that um, if you stumble, if your tongue trips while you're reading your work out loud to yourself, then that is an indication that perhaps you don't have correct phrasing or word choice. And it's also an opportunity for you to, to fix it, right? So, um, so yeah, read, write every day and for just a few minutes and, and read your work aloud to yourself and, and you will I am the poster child for, for, you know, perseverance, right? Because, you know, I just didn't think 10 years ago that I would be sitting here talking to you today, right? And so um, I, I think all writers um, have one thing in common because all of our journeys are so different, right? But all of us have one thing in common and that's that we didn't quit. And despite all the people who told us along the way that it wasn't good enough or we wouldn't make it, that we just didn't stop. And, and so I think if, if you just keep going, it will eventually happen. <laughs> so. Thank you. And that, and I love that. I love the idea of reading it out loud after you've written it. That's such a fascinating um, and, and, and different way, I think, to think about writing. <laughs> yeah. And we have a, we, it, it's not a question, but it's a comment from the audience. Um, they say it's a pleasurable read. It's very lyrical and passionate and, and also funny in, in places as well, despite being about a happy topic. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, just for curiosity, do you find it easier or harder to be writing during this time when we're all sort of like confined to our homes <laughs> right now during the pandemic? <laughs> yeah, you know, this is this is such a hard time. And I, I feel like um, this is a hard time because there's just so much uncertainty. You know, I think, people would cope a lot better if we all just knew exactly when it would be over. But the fact that it is continuing and we don't know what's going to happen, I think that's really hard for, for everyone, right? But I think for writers, it's very hard, right? I think all of us some way are intrinsically um, delighted when we're given a deadline of some kind. So my my way of coping is that I've set the bar very low. <laughs> There's no um, shame in that I at all right now. I am requiring myself, right? I am requiring myself to write one sentence each day. And mm -hmm. so I often write more, but I'm not requiring myself to write more. And then everything after that is ice cream and cake, right? It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's dessert. You know, I got six sentences today, or I got a, you know, I got a whole page, but I'm really just doing the very bare minimum requirement. I must sit down and I must compose a sentence. Some mm -hmm. sentences have, you know, three words in them. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so, you know, and once you get that one out of the way, you're, you're good. You know, you can do whatever you want. The pressure's off. Right. And so I, I would suggest that people Kind of give themselves a break here and and not expect too much. I I realize there are the stories of you know Shakespeare and King Lear and 
Newton and the law of gravity. <laughs> you I know, know. It's like... <laughs> during, during other plague, plague yeah. times, but, but really a sentence a day is very manageable. I think we could all, all do that. Just, um, and just sort of keep our hand in it, but not, not worry about it too much. Cause I think we're all under enough pressure right now, just trying to, you know, manage the day manage the hour you know so yeah. completely agree it's yeah. like somebody, we're we're not working we're at home uh trying to work through a crisis right now exactly from, right which is right. different than working from home right <laughs> yeah. yeah indeed indeed mm -hmm. oh, well, well thank you so much debbie and and yes everybody out there who <clears throat> um this is good even if you're if you're not an aspiring writer, write a sentence a day. I think that is good advice for all of us too. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And congratulations again. Thanks, I really appreciate it. Um, next up, we have David Yoon, um, our our Youth Award winner for Frankly in Love. I'll just give a second for, hello, David. Thank Hi. you so for being here. Congratulations again. Yay, thanks for having me and, and it's such an honor. It's a special honor because, you know, as an Asian American, uh, growing up, never being seen, never being sort of recognized, this is a huge for me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. The honor is definitely ours. We're having all of you here. Um, we would like, to, our question is, um, what are your future ambitions and what will you tackle next? And are there still plans to make the book into a movie? <laughs> uh, uh, the, the second question is easy. It, there's still plans. Uh, the script uh, apparently has been finalized and we're looking for a director. Um, so, so things are happening. Um, and it's exciting. But you know, uh, things were happening and then quarantine hit. So that threw a monkey wrench into pretty much everything. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to topics that I want to tackle next, I'm currently mm -hmm. um, really obsessed with uh, uh, toxic masculinity. Mm. Um, just because it's, you know, if you're, if, if you're a guy in America, there's, there's like so many expectations of behavior. Um, the acceptable sort of spectrum of behavior is very narrow um, for, for most guys. And then if you throw in uh, the fact that you're a minority, it gets even more narrow um, until it's paper thin. And so it's, a, it's an interesting subject and it's an interesting sort of self-made prison that I think uh, it wor is worth exploring um, because once I, I just get, I, I have a suspicion that if, if guys knew that there are other ways of being and that it was okay mm -hmm. to be that way, um, that a more free society would sort of release all these sort of bottled up repressions and and, um, and anxieties and we'd have a different, the world would look, uh, be a very different place. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking to that. Uh, I'm also thinking a lot about whiteness these days mm. um, and how, uh, what whiteness is and the history of it and what role it plays, not in everyday life now, but um, what role it played in the formation of this nation uh, and what role it played in the entire American project from the start. Uh, it's, it's a big, huge topic, so I'm trying to chunk it out. And uh, it's also a scary topic because I know you know, lots of my friends are white and, and they're, I know that they're a little anxious to think about this even. Um, but I do think it really needs to be talked about because it's, it's a central, I guess, feature of the American profile um, that really needs dissecting and, and unpacking. Mm -hmm. Agreed, agreed. And hopefully, hopefully um, with all the calls for change and the, and the current, I think, awakening among many, uh, non-BIPOC people, hopefully there'll be a more receptive audience as well to oh, this totally. topic. Mm -hmm. Totally, yeah. But I mean, that's not to say that I'm not writing fun stuff too. I mean, not, mm -hmm. not serious mm -hmm. stuff. Like Super Fake Love Song, which is my next book coming up in November. Um, mm -hmm. It's a rom-com. It's just a rom-com. It's about a nerdy guy who lies about being a rock star to impress a girl. And, and it's just <laughs> fun. And I figure after this year, 2020, we could use a few laughs, so it's it's just pure fun, and I am working on something uh, with my wife as well. That's also pure fun, oh. um, and you know, as like as as BIPOC as minorities, we 
man, I got tired about talking this stuff, talking about like justice and equality. And mm. it's like, we talk about it so much every day that it's fatiguing. Mm -hmm. And I just, I'm really hungry for stories about, you know, people like me who are just falling in love and living their lives and being happy. Um, away from the white gaze and away from issues of, of racism and everything. I mean, I think issue books are critical in teaching specifically white people about racism. Um, but I do think that non-issue books are critical for us um, to be a haven from all that, a safe place to be with all your emotions. Um, and I also think, you know, if, if, if a white person picks up a non-issue book, um, and reads it and is like, oh my God, you know, they're humans with emotions and, and desires just like me and fears and anxieties and joys, then I think that is, is a huge win too. That's exposure therapy. Agreed. And there's lots and lots of agreement from the audience, also from Harmony and Devi. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, we need, we need joy in the world for us as well, in addition to... Um, we deserve joy. Agreed. Agreed. Um, oh, and there is an there is a question about from the audience who is very excited about the movie for Frankly in Love. Um, they want to know: Are you still involved in the process? Um, I think possibly as a screenwriter for the for the movie. Um, there, a screenwriter has has been attached and, and wrote the oh, script okay, already. Okay, okay. okay. Um, mm -hmm. I consult on it a lot. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. so much fun. It's also tough because you can't fit everything in the movie because the book is pretty long. Yes. And, uh, you have to pick and choose. Mm. So yeah. Oh. Are there any scenes, any specific um, parts of the book that, uh, and I realize this might be a little bit, um, uh, they just ask about that because they might yeah. get into <laughs> the movie. But are there any any things that like you would really love to see in the movie that, well, that you you don't want to get cut? Hopefully. <laughs> oh my God, that's like choosing a lot of babies. <laughs> Yes, uh, sorry, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I mean, there there are some, uh, I'm gonna spoil everything, but there are some definite key scenes in the book. Like mm -hmm. there's a scene that happens on a boat that we'll see what happens. There's a scene that happens, um, you know, at home toward the end that mm -hmm. I'm really, is very important to me. But we'll see what happens. A, a movie is a different beast than a book and you can't fit as much stuff in a movie as you can with a book. With a book you have, a huge blank canvas to draw upon. A movie, by comparison, is about that big. <laughs> true, very true. And a uh, comment from the audience. Yes, the audience wants more stories about all aspects of life, please. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> it is interesting though. There's been kind of a like um, renaissance for Asian Americans, especially in like uh, cinema and the TV and in romantic comedies. Do you think this is... Yeah. You're gonna and you're gonna your next book is going to be a rom com as well. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. like, what are your thoughts on sort of like it, it's interesting how how like Asian American artists seem to be gravitating towards this genre? <laughs> well, well, first of all, it's like thanks Kevin Kwan. Um, <laughs> yes, that is true. Honestly, I, I cried all through Crazy Rich Asians. I just cried the whole time for no reason. I was just like, we're up on the screen, man. Look at it, and we're like mm -hmm. falling in love. Um, and thanks for the gold opens and, and, mm. you know, all, all the efforts, but also I think there's a, there's a shift happening because there's a demographic shift and more and more kids are frankly, like falling in love with different kinds of people, mm. you know, and having kids That's and whatever. True. And, and, uh, like frankly in love could not have been published six years ago. No way. Yes. Like when, when my wife, Nikki was writing everything, everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She was terrified of making the character black because mm -hmm. there were no black women characters as female leads in anything, anything. And um, we did it and it was a success. And she, that gave her the confidence to make The Sun is Also a Star. Um, mm -hmm. I'm in her office right now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, um, because um, then, you know, she can, and even then she came out at, we used to write at four in the morning. So she would come out at four in the morning. Mm -hmm. And she was like, hey, I, I kind of want to make the, the main characters look like me and you. Is that weird? And I was like, are we weird? I don't think so, you know. Um, and so she did it and it led to, it had this like um, ripple effect where it led to 
obviously the book was published and then the movie was made and then we had people up on the screen and we had posters and book covers and collateral with people who look like us and it was a huge win um but honestly man as as recent as six years ago it was not possible and that's that's kind of stuff that i i have to remind myself that that up until very recently it, it was it was pretty bad it's still really bad um but it's getting a little bit better there's things like aquafina from queens Mm-hmm. And there's um, Never Have I Ever, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yes. And also, you know, Master of None. Like mm-hmm. all those shows hopefully are building momentum that lay more groundwork for future artists to work upon. Um, yeah, so right now I think it's a pretty good time. I think it could be better. So we're going to work on making more stuff. My daughter's always like, she's like, I like this X book, movie, whatever show, but there weren't enough kids who look like me in it. And I was like, that's why we have to make our own art. That's where I have to do it. That if it's not there, make it yourself. That is very, very, very true. <laughs> and I can see in the in the back, is that um, The Sun is a Star, the print? In- oh, this is, this is a, it's a piece of art. It's actually um, nails in a board with, with thread. Oh my goodness. This artist in Brooklyn, who they, who, wow. uh, Random House commissioned, this obsessive compulsive artist who makes these wonderful, like hand threaded, typographical things um and they sent it to us it's actually a physical piece it weighs about like 20 pounds oh my goodness wow that's cool (laughs) so you're just gonna check really quickly um is there anything else about the about um yeah um is there anything else um about frankly about that you like would like to share with the with the audience any parts that like you were uh, you're working on that didn't quite make it into the book or <laughs> other sort of stories there, just writing. <laughs> there's actually an interesting scene in the book where mm-hmm. I personally learned a lot. Um, mm-hmm. I uh, I there's a scene where Frank is sort of volunteered to play food tour guide, and we all know the feeling. You're hanging out with a bunch of white people, and mm-hmm. you're at a restaurant, and they're like, "All right, so." what is all this I'm eating? And, and I'm like, a lot of times I just don't know. I'm like, I don't actually know what that is. It's kind of like, I don't know what ketchup really is mm-hmm. or what is actually in mustard. I just eat it and it tastes good. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I wrote a scene in which a similar thing happens and Frank gets really angry and he kind of loses it. And, mm-hmm. and we read, I read the scene, I shared it with some people and they're like, they're like, this is kind of harsh and no one comes off looking really well. And I've been doing a lot of meditating and going to therapy. And I was trying to think about how do you write from a place of positivity? And how do you maintain a positive outlook when you're faced with unrealistic expectations from other people? Um, And so I really kind of had to dig deep emotionally and write from a place of love. That's why Frank loves his parents, even though they drive him completely nuts. Because it's a harder journey, but I think it's more worthy um, to embark on that road to acceptance um and similarly if you look at the other person's point of view they're totally ignorant about say korean food and so they're just innocently asking a question it, it doesn't mean anything it's just you know frank's own insecurities about being othered and being you know foreignized uh, orientalized that he finds that triggering but if you take a breath and stop and you realize that it's just simple ignorance it's not like stupidity, which is willful ignorance. It's just totally innocent ignorance. Um, then you can you can find a place of positivity and be like, you know what? I think this is this. I think this is that. And the lesson that Frank learns is to say, I don't know. And that it's okay to say, I don't know. Um, there's lots of things about a traditional American food that I just don't know. And it's mm-hmm. okay not to know these things. So apply the same expectation towards yourself and assert that that stamp. <laughs> it's kind of weird to be to confidently say like, I don't know. I don't know what that is. <laughs> and I'm proud of it. <laughs> but it does free you from the expectation mm-hmm. of having to be expert on all things Asian. We don't represent, we're not a personal referendum on all things Asian. Uh, so to say, I don't know, instantly humanizes you mm-hmm. and it, it puts you at the same level as a peer. So now you're on this journey of eating cold noodles together, not knowing quite what it is, but knowing that it's just delicious. 
Um, so that was that was a huge lesson for me um, when I was writing the book. And uh, and I I say I don't know all the time now. I don't know what that is. What's this sushi? I don't know what that is. It's red. <laughs> Oh, thank you for that. And, and yes, that I really, Harmony, Harmony says she's going to take that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's really good, good advice for all of us to take as well. And not to oh, thanks. Well, David, thank you so much. Congratulations again. And look forward to hearing more from, from, from all of your different projects coming up. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's a, it's a tremendous honor. I can't tell you enough. It's just like recognition, validation. <laughs> It's, it's, the, it's a good sun in me, the dutiful sun. I'm like super happy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank and, you. Um, oh, before we move on to our to our next author, um, just a reminder to everyone watching on YouTube, uh, please log into YouTube to um, to ask any questions or make any comments. Thank you. Okay. So um, our next author is Patty Kim, the author of I'm Okay. I'll just give a second for Patty to. Uh, Come on, uh, uh, Patty, are you there? I am here, but okay. I think you have to enable my video. Oh, that's because the host has disabled it. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Let me. Okay, I have asked to start your video. Do you see the? Okay, there we oh, go. Great. Excellent, Yay. excellent. Got it. <laughs> Patty, thanks so much for being with us, and congratulations. Thank um, you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions that uh, the committee came up with. And one of them is, what were your inspirations for, for I'm OK? And how meaningful was it for you to talk about the Korean Baptist Church community? A <clears throat> um, couple of corrections. So the book is oh. called I'm Ok, um, after his name. Oh, goodness. Oh, goodness. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that's OK, because there's, a, there's an excerpt um, in the book itself that you know refers to OK. And then there's just double meaning to it. So that's fine. Um, and another correction, it's not actually a Baptist church, it's a full gospel assembly of God church, oh, uh, Korean, which is, um, which is different, which is a little bit more Pentecostal than the, uh, the, the Baptist church. Um, mm -hmm. But inspiration, um, I had this sort of, uh, okay, the way I write is that I, I, I kind of get obsessed with um, a particular scene that I, I just can't forget. And it was a scene of, um, of a man falling off of a roof. Um, and, and, the, and then he, it was a construction worker, a roofer falling off. And so this was just sort of playing in my um, imagination for a while. Um, I, I don't know anybody who has fallen off a roof. I don't know why it was haunting me for a while, but um, I just kept asking questions about this man and, um, and who he was and, uh, who his family was, did he have children, did he have a wife, um, and, it, and as those questions got asked, um, I think I started, the answers that I started coming up with was very much related to, like, my own um, sort of immigrant experience, um, the families that I've observed and, and known um, when we first came to America, so, and, and then I, I just felt like this, this story needs to be heard or this family needs to have um, a platform, um, and especially the child who's left behind to um, grieve and try to pick up the pieces. Um, so those were sort of, that, that's one of the origins of the story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, that is, that really resonates for me because I didn't see this, but when I was living in Austin, Texas, that is what happened to some construction workers who were working on a high rise across the street from me, from where I lived. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, that would thank you for for bringing this family story um, to life. <laughs> and uh, um, we. We saw that there's, we see that there's already a sequel following Mickey. Is there yes. a, a book yes. about Asa as well? Uh, no, there's no book about Asa. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't plan on it. Um, Mickey's book, uh, which is called, it's uh, Girls Like You, Mickey, just came out, you know, during quarantine, <laughs> which was Excellent. interesting. Excellent. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so she, she, her book is out. Um, I, I'm thinking about a third book uh, for the series. Uh, the introdu- the character gets introduced in, in Mickey's um, book and her name is um, Sanju. And um, she is sort of occupying my imagination right now. Um, so there may be a third, there may be not. Uh, I'm also working on something entirely different too, um, uh, which is kind of sort of secret. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, That's okay, um, mm-hmm. um, So yeah. That's exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, have you been able to like do virtual book tours or talks with, um, but I did. I managed to, on, on my book launch, uh, for my book launch event, I managed to do a talk with the Prince George's County Memorial um, oh, Library. They, great, did, they great. did a nice long interview and they, they were programming virtually and they're really trying to just support the community with um, and parents with kids mm-hmm. programs. So they were kind enough to um, give me an hour interview. And I believe if you log on to, uh, to their site on YouTube, they're having um, uh, Jason Reynolds being interviewed September 1st. Mm-hmm. So check that out. Wow. Prince George's County Memorial Library. We're going to, everybody, everybody watching at home, log on to Prince George's County Library. <laughs> Is your talk? like recorded can people see that like on the website yeah i think it is recorded if you go to their site uh, you you can see Mm -hmm. yeah you can see the talk excellent excellent um just gonna look right there um are are there any questions from the audience or any comments (laughs) none of this this time but oh wait wait (laughs) sorry (laughs) I think they're typing. <laughs> um, someone really appreciated your acceptance speech. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, talking about saturated representation. Okay. Yes, yes, that dawned on me for some reason. I kept thinking about um, I kept thinking about that because I, I, I got a lot of comments regarding Oak's sort of misbehavior. Um, so readers were saying, oh, he's like, he's, he's not exactly, you know, the most likable character because he, he does make mistakes. He, he's, he you know, I don't want to give the story away, but he, he's not your ideal, you know, good citizen kid. Um, he's not goody two shoes. And so, and then I, I kept thinking about that and I thought, well, you know, why can't a Korean American boy be misbehave every once in a while? You know, mm-hmm. and it's because there is lack of representation. You know, when there is a lack of representation, then you take one character or one, you know, somebody and you put an entire people. You know, you you make assumptions about an entire race or people or whoever because of that one character. So if if you have a representation that's saturated, I mean, think about white America. It's like you can have the most heinous characters come up and no one's going to say, oh, that's a real bad representation of of white people. You know, it's not. It's So that's the unfairness that I was feeling when there was Mm -hmm. criticism about how Oak is not, you know, a a model minority, a good kid. Mm -hmm. Like, you know. (laughs) He he's, human. Be. He's, he's human. He's a he's a 12-year-old boy. Come on, mm-hmm. let him be that, you know? And just because he's a he's a Korean American and he's you know, and we, and we're, I want to be able to air out dirty laundry. I mean, that's when you really get to know uh, an individual, a character, right? So, uh, in order to be, you know, seen as completely human, flawed, you, you have to let those characters live and thrive. In, in fiction, in art, um, in movies, everywhere, you know. Um, so yes, I am aiming for a saturated representation of Asian Americans in art, <laughs> in mm-hmm. film, in books, everywhere, so that there's not this criticism of where you're not doing our people justice, you know. Yes. Please, please. Like a multi- we should be represented in all the multitudinous of our experiences. Yes, yes. Um, and David says, here, here, and love it. <laughs> Thank you, David. 
Hard co-sign from Candice. Um, and another, one more question from the audience. Uh, just for fun, what genre would you like to see more representation in? And Debbie also co-signs. <laughs> Which genre, in, in, in literary mm -hmm. genre or in just uh, arts uh, throughout? I'm gonna guess maybe just arts throughout. <laughs> oh, God. I, think, I think film is like really powerful right now and, and mm -hmm. it has such a huge audience. Film would be great, but I think children's literature and children's film or, or kid lit or, you know, YA, that's a really important genre just because I think the return um, on investment is greater because these are young minds, you know, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. at that point, it's like if they're exposed to it at that age, the expectation is there at that point. And then when the expectation is there, the market has to respond. So I think mm -hmm. getting to the, you know, the, the children's literature, children's film, YA, that young demographic is really important. And, and also like adults, I think, I mean, I'm 50 years old and, and I, my, as much as I'd like to think that, you know, I can change my mind, I, I, you know, there are things that I'm just stubborn about. And I think adults are just kind of a little stubborn. So I think we should reach out to like minds that are just really open and, um, and questioning and ready and, and yeah, so. No, I, I think we can definitely, as librarians, we, we definitely can agree with that. Like, yes, get them for their young. <laughs> Thank you librarians for doing that too. You guys play a huge role in, in, in shaping those minds. Mm, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> um, let's see, just checking quickly. Um, there will be time for um, more comments and, and uh, questions later, but for now, thank you so much, Patty, again, really appreciate your being here and congratulations again. Thank you very much. It's a complete honor. I I'm so happy. Thank you. Should I hold up my plaque? Yes, please. That would be great. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and our next author is Aisha Saeed, the author of Blau Cook's Doll. <laughs> Hi, Aisha. <clears throat> Thank you so much yeah. for being here. <laughs> and congratulations to you. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I loved um, that you mentioned in your acceptance speech that readers are contacting you about making the recipe. So just, just to back up a bit, um, for those who haven't uh, read the book or seen your speech, there's a you included the recipe for making Shana doll in the in the back of Bilal Coates doll so that people can make it after uh, after reading the book. And I love that people have been have been making it and writing in to you and sharing their experiences about it. Um, what have been some of your uh, I guess like favorite stories or favorite moments from hearing about readers doing this? <laughs> Um, I think I think the the best part is uh, well. First of all, it's a family recipe. It's the recipe mm -hmm. that I grew up on having, and I get lots of uh, people that are like, "Well, what about an instant pot?" You know, he could have just made it in an instant pot. <laughs> I said, "Well, yes, but when I was writing this story, instant pots weren't as prevalent. And growing up, that's not how I ate it in an instant pot. We made it in a slow cooker, and it took mm -hmm. all day. And that was part of the fun of it. Um, and so I think I think though the most uh, the most uh, satisfying is hearing from parents who said that their kids are picky eaters, but because of the story and how excited the kids were in the story, they thought, okay, well, we'll try it out. And so being able to be, for this book to be a bridge for children to try something new that they hadn't tried before. Um, and so, so that, that's been my, I think, one of, one of the really fun parts. And then the other thing that's really, amazing is to hear from parents um, who have children who eat doll. And so they make mine and everybody has a different recipe. And so they'll share what theirs is. And so it's really interesting because even though it is one particular doll, lentil, there's so many ways to make it. So that's been really amazing to see. Love it. I love too, um, one thing that I really loved about this, it's kind of the inverse of the, like, so the traditional lunchroom um, incident for like, for many, <laughs> Kids of color where, and just for this for anybody who doesn't know, it's where you bring something from your own culture to like the cafeteria, you open it up and then all the kids are like, ew, what is that? That smells and <laughs> because they're not familiar with it. And I just love how this is like the, um, the opposite of that, where 
even though Paul was at first was like anxious that people might not like it, his friends all like totally embrace it if, um, <laughs> when they when they try it. And was that something that like was intentional or just? Uh, uh, yes. That way. Yeah. It it was, it was definitely intentional. Um, mm -hmm. I, I grew up, I have many memories of that, <laughs> where mm -hmm. I would bring the food and everybody kind of mm -hmm. jumps back. Um, and I've definitely, I've definitely had that. When I was writing the story, um, I don't know, I, I think I've shared before that mm -hmm. the story was inspired by my two-year-old son who had come back from nursery school and said mm -hmm. that when he shared with everyone that his favorite food was doll during mm -hmm. circle time, that nobody knew what that was. And that mm -hmm. led to me bringing in some different lentils for the class and talking about it. And at two, two and a half, children um, absorbed, most children haven't absorbed those um, notions of, I don't like that, this is, yeah, you know, they, they're pretty open and curious. And so they were mm -hmm. at that age, they were curious and they were excited about the doll. And, um, and so that's where the, the idea of writing this came from. Like, let's take it from a place of curiosity that children have in joy. There can be insensitivity and there can be that, but I do hope that's changing. And I didn't want mm -hmm. to reflect that in this book because I wanted, brown kids who pick up this book to read it and be happy and to have a happy mm -hmm. association with their food and their culture and, and to have pride in it. I didn't want to be dishonest because it's true sometimes other children from other cultures may not understand the food. So I did have some uncertainty, but I didn't want to dig too far down that road because I did want this to be a joyful book for children. Mm, agreed. It's, it's like what David was saying about like, we, we deserve to have something happy for ourselves. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> oh, and Teresa says that she really needs to get the book. And her husband just made an Ethiopian lentil dish yesterday. Um, but they got, the, they got a shipment of doll and she'll be making some soon. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. <Hey. laughs> see. Oh, and I, I, had, I had a question that I was going to pick up on, which just escaped my mind. But um, let, let's start the audience and see if are there any questions from the audience? Hopefully you'll come back to me <laughs> thinking about it. <laughs> Okay. None yet, but oh, I, I think I do. It, it was it was my question. It was a comment, but yes, I was just thinking about how. Um, um, I don't know if you saw on Slate there was this recent like Dear Abby or Dear Prudence um, letter about how this. I think a, a white parent was like shocked that that um, so that uh, an Indian family who her their son was friends with like gave them like fed him. Uh, like curry and they were and they were just appalled that that somehow like oh you you gave him foreign like quote unquote foreign food without like letting us know and they expected I saw that yeah so <laughs> I'm just like oh my goodness <laughs> yeah yeah. <sighs> yeah and I and I really think books are <clears throat> such a great way to introduce that concept and uh, and and Bilal Cookstall is not the first to introduce food in this way. Um, when I was writing the book, I definitely, um, I read books like um, that talk about food and exploring it. And one of the books was The Ugly Vegetables by Grace Lynn, <laughs> um, which I love and my kids love. And it's such a specific thing about this one soup and that mom makes and she feels really uncertain and looks at the other neighbors and they have such pretty flowers and they have these ugly vegetables. But then it shows how the whole community ends up falling in love with this soup and she takes pride mm -hmm. in it. And, and that was also a guiding force for me for seeing stories like that. There's also um, Cora Cook's Pansy, mm -hmm. sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, um, mm -hmm. by Dorina Gilmore. Um, and that one is about this girl, Cora, who cooks with her mom for the very first time and they make her favorite dish. Again, there's some uncertainty in the book, but there's a lot of joy about that food. And that's actually one of the ways that I... Um, find new recipes with my uh, my kids because they they love those kind of stories and they love um, activities that they can do later on, whether it be a project at the end of a picture book or a food recipe. And so, um, so yeah, so those are some really other really good food picture books. Oh, that's, um, we do have a question from the from the audience. Um, are you thinking of, of, of writing another book about food for your, for your next project? <laughs> uh, <laughs> So my next few projects don't involve uh, food per se, but I have been told that I I write I do write food into all my books. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a book, my second book, A Mall Unbound, uh, took place in Pakistan. And um, every time I would go on school visits, I'd say half my school visits, um, the teachers and the parents would surprise me with, 
uh, with food from the book because they said there's so much food in the book that they couldn't stop thinking about the food and they end up looking it up. So food will always be in my book, food from Pakistan, um, South Asia, um, because I love it and it just shows up in my books. But uh, I, at the moment, no, there's no um, specific books about food coming up. But there will be food <laughs> involved. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, and um, a couple comments from the audience. Um, so one audience member uh, just wants to like really thank you for making such a sweet and happy book. And they really, they love the recipe. Um, thank you. And another audience member is is going to, they're going to make sure to promote the book to kids. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, the librarian. <laughs> and um, just one sort of, it, it, we're totally being tongue in cheek about the, how do you, how do you make rice? As you probably saw, there was this whole like thing on YouTube about like the best way to cook rice <laughs> between like um, two chefs. And yeah, we we're just joking about like, like how do you how do you cook and wash rice? <laughs> oh wow, I didn't I didn't know that. I'm gonna have to look that okay. up. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a BBC um, video about like making rice, and then let's just say there were there were many thoughts of feelings about it. <laughs> so I. I soak my rice and then I, I make it Pakistani style or mm. South Asian style, which is I chop up onions, I saute them mm. till they get a little bit brown. I put mm -hmm. in um, cumin, um, yes, cumin seeds and sizzle them a little bit. Then I put in one to one, so one cup of water, one cup of um, rice and mm -hmm. some salt and you boil it mm -hmm. till there's big, big bubbles and then you steam it for 15 minutes. So it's a little mm. different from most people, I think, uh, that kind mm. of way make it but mm -hmm. unfortunately my family's very spoiled because now I do have an instant pot and I want to make mm -hmm. it in the cooker you just throw everything in and you turn it on but everybody's gotten really used to the the long way so mm -hmm. <laughs> so I make it like that <laughs> yeah sometimes sometimes that's the best way <laughs> to do yeah. it yeah <laughs> things can take time and they can be worth it <laughs> Free. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Aisha. It's a real, it's a real pleasure to be. I was the chair of the picture book committee, so it's a real pleasure. Yeah, to Yeah, thank you so much. It was such an honor. It was, the it, I still remember that day. It was so exciting to start getting all these texts and messages, and then finding out the news. It was the best day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. And last but not, but definitely not least, um, we have Teresa. Uh, Robinson, who is the author of the Queen of, of our Picture Book Award winner, The Queen of Physics. i just give Teresa a second to walk on. Hi, Teresa. Thank you so much for being with us and congratulations. Thank you for having me. We were talking a little bit before the event started about how um, you were saying even physicists don't know, or not every all physicists were uh, familiar with Wu Chen Shin. So um, could you tell us a little bit about how you first heard about her? You know, <laughs> I think I started the first draft of the story back in 2012. And honestly, at this point, especially when you're in your mid 50s, you really don't remember things that well. <laughs> so I'm not really sure how I first heard about her, but physics is my jam. I just love, love, love physics. In an alternate universe, I would probably be an astrophysicist and not a writer sitting here talking to you. <laughs> but um, so my husband, who's a climate scientist, he um, used to get the paper subscription to Physics Today magazine. And I used to read them. Uh, I get my own subscription now. But um, and I think I probably first read about her there. Mm -hmm. Don't quote me on that, because mm -hmm. like I said, it's been a while and I really don't remember exactly. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> so that I started writing about her, you know, around 2012 and here we are, 2000, you know, 20 and <laughs> finally it's out. <laughs> wow. And was it was it relatively like um what was the research process like what were there I mean there's the Time magazine article or, or no Newsweek article um cover obviously, but were there, was there other information that was readily available about her? <clears throat> oh. Um, yeah, actually. Uh, so when I first started, you know, writing about her, I read all the kids books that are out there about her, which there weren't oh. actually any. She was mm -hmm. 
well, there was one I think dedicated to her, but um, that was middle grade mm -hmm. biography. And then she was also in some essays in other collections for kids, but not oh, a book about her specifically. And mm -hmm. from there, I, you know, looked in their, um, the references that they listed and I read other books, um, some essays about her in adult books. And then I had my husband um, through the university uh, take out mm. books um, like that she had written. She had written the definitive text on beta decay, for example, and just a you know, number of other books and, and publication articles. Um, and that's how I did my research. I started out with kids books first and then I went up to, you know, adult books and articles and her books. Wow. No, that's fascinating. Um, do, you, do you know if she's like well known in, in China or Asia? Um, well, she was back in her day, hmm. just like she was hmm. well known here back in her day. But um, I, I think unfortunately she's been, you know, mostly I, forgotten, which is, uh, I just really want kids to know about her because I'm also a great advocate of girls mm -hmm. going into STEM. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, my passion's physics, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you, um, have you, are you, have you found other historical figures to write about for like, um, for your next book or? <clears throat> yeah, I actually um, have someone that I started writing a middle grade proposal on. So the proposal oh, great, is great. done and I just have to wait for my agent to okay it and then send it out to other people. But I'm, I'm also, I recently got a contract to write a couple of other biographies that I can't talk about. <laughs> So, oh, congratulations. Excited, That's fantastic. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. And we just have a comment for the audience. Yay, Teresa. I love Queen of Physics. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you do too. Um, what, going back to just the um, reason why I asked about Asia was like, I, I'm kind of curious if there are any plans to maybe do a like Chinese translation of the book so it could be more, so she could perhaps be reintroduced to you. Um, Asian countries and <clears throat> I hope so. I really don't know. That's, that's a good question to ask my publisher about. <laughs> love for that to happen. And one day, if we could travel again, I would, you know, love to go and, yes. you know, go around China and promote the book. <laughs> right, right. Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm, I'm, and I apologize, I'm getting, a, a, um, I'm being told that we need to wrap up soon. That's all right. <laughs> but, uh, but there will be time at, um, for everybody to make some, some closing uh, comments and remarks. So um, thank you so much, Teresa. We really, okay. really, it's a pleasure to meet you and congratulations. Thank you. Okay. And thank you, everybody. Um, the Q&A portion is now completed. I'm gonna turn it back over to Candice for the closing. <laughs> everyone um sorry about that um thank you so much for joining us today um both um authors and viewers and also um to of course our awesome chairs um of our um the apollo literature award committees um the the, the chair of chairs dora ho van basco um and helen lick um as well as um the chairs of our literature award committees um, for adult literature, fiction, adult literature, nonfiction, um, children's literature, youth literature, um, and also um, picture books, and of course all of the members um, of those committees. Um, everyone who is a part of Apala is a volunteer. And so thank you all for taking um, time and energy atten and attention out of your schedules um, to be a part of this, to help um, elevate um, and, and highlight all of these wonderful um, stories. Um, I also wanted to just remind folks that if you um, enjoyed uh, this programming, um, please remember to um, join or renew your membership in Apala. Um, our website is www.apalaweb.org. Um, and 
this is our, we're continuing to celebrate our 40th anniversary of Apollo. Um, so please be sure to, if you are able to and interested, we're doing a um, fundraising campaign and asking folks just to, to if you can donate $1 um, for each year that our association has been in existence. So $40 and there's more information about that um, on our website as well. Um, and last but certainly not least, is there anything that folks, um, that the authors, any last comments that any of the authors would um, like to share? We can, I, um, I'd like to invite everyone who is involved in the event today to turn on their cameras and um, audio. If you have any last questions or want to say thank you and bye as we close out um, this amazing and first ever virtual Apollo Lit Award ceremony. <laughs> so I just want to say thanks. Um, it was so nice to see everyone, uh, see everyone. Um, and it's such an honor to be here. And and yeah, I hope our paths cross again in real life. It would be so nice to, to meet up with, with all of you. It would be awesome. But thank you so much. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank yeah, you. Thank everyone. you, everyone. Thank you for having us. Be safe. Take care. Thank you, Apollo. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you and congratulations. Be safe. And thank you again for sharing all of your stories and your time and energy and attention with us and being able to log in today and helping to answer those um, great questions from the audience. So. Thank you, thank you, and we will make the recording available at some point in the future, hopefully soon, <laughs> once we figure it out. So thanks again, and have a great afternoon and weekend, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Congratulations, everyone. Thank Goodbye. Congratulations. 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 Thank you. <laughs>